Hello. Good evening, everyone. Dear colleagues and friends, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you and thank you for joining us in this webinar. This webinar is on ALS, anatrophic lateral sclerosis. It is one of the educational activities of the Emirate Neurology Society. And the credit goes to Dr. Sohail Rakon, the president of the society, who is organizing such meetings. This webinar is sponsored by Biologix, organized by the MCO, and endorsed by the Emens. Thanks for all for their contribution. The title of the webinar is Understanding ALS from Disease Course to Clinical Trials. And tonight we will identify the various clinical trials and, the, and we will discuss the latest updates on ALS genetics and molecular rules. This is an interactive webinar. So we invite you and we, uh, we encourage you to submit your questions at the Q and A button icon you see it at the bottom of the screen. And the speaker will be more than happy to, to address your questions. This webinar is CME accredited and the MCO, the organizers, will notify you by email at the time to get or when you will get the certificate. And now it's my great pleasure to welcome and introduce our distinguished guest speaker, Dr. Annie Marie Hubers. Hubers. Dr. Hubers is associate physician at the Neurology Department of Clinical Neurosciences in Geneva University Hospital, Switzerland. And Dr. Huber will be talking about understanding ALS from disease course to clinical trials. Dr. Huber, please, the virtual floor is yours. Good evening. Thank you, thank you Mr. Chairman, for, for your kind introduction. Uh, thank you. Thanks to everybody for having me. It's a great pleasure um, to talk during um, to, to talk tonight and um, I will now share my screen. So I'll talk about 50 minutes plus minus and uh, I will, I'll be talking about um, the basics um, of ALS from disease course to clinical trials. So in general, there can be uh, central nervous system and peripheral nervous system lesions. Obviously, in different conditions, you have different kinds of um, disease or of lesions. And in uh, the classical ALS, which is an affection of um, the central and the peripheral nervous system, you might ha may have on the one hand a central spastic paresis due to lesion of the first motor neuron and a end or a flexed paresis due to ventral horn lesion or nucle nuclear lesions. So if you look at uh, this um, um, scheme of um, the motor neuro, uh, motor unit. In general, um, motor neuron diseases are located really at the body of the neuron, at the core of the neuron, whereas mimicking diseases, especially um, peripheral neuropathies, are located on the axon. And then of course you have all the lesions uh, related to the to muscle diseases, like for example, myopathies or lesions of the neuromuscular junctions, which might be um, in general myasthenia, gravis or Lambert-Eaton syndrome. Clinical features of ALS, um, include general, generalized wasting and fasciculations of um, facial or limb muscles, a bulbar involvement that is um, 
involvement of swallowing and tongue muscles is common. And these peripheral um, uh, paresis may be uh, associated with upper motor neuron signs and symptoms. And as you all know, un un unfortunately, this is an aggressive, steadily progressive condition, which leads to, which is fatal at, at the end. How may, um, may motor neuron diseases um, present on the clinical level? You may, you may have, or the patient may show just a selective loss of lower motor neurons from pons, medulla oblongata, and the spinal cord together combined with um, upper motor neuron loss originating from the brain, from the cortex. And the clinical picture obviously varies, can vary quite, quite widely, um, depending on whether there's more upper motor neuron or more no, lower motor neuron involvement, which muscles are involved, and the rate of cell body loss um, on the neuropathological level. So if you just look at um, the motor neuron, um, here is this um, mm, the schemes um, showing uh, the first motor neuron on, on the one, one end of the spectrum and the second motor neuron on the other end of the spectrum with um, primary lateral sclerosis um, representing a classical disease involving mainly the upper or almost exclusively for a very long period of time, the upper motor neuron and as a typical representative of um, solely um, affection of the lower motor neuron, you may find progressive, so, so called progressive muscular atrophy. And in the middle, you have the classical um, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis with um, affection of both the upper and the lower motor neuron. We also um, distinguish between um, different onset types. About 70% of patients show what we call a spinal onset. So onset, disease onset with paresis um, on the region of the limbs. And around 30% show disease onset in the bulbar region. So um, swallowing muscles, um, tongue muscles, etc. For central paresis may present on the clinical level as increased reflexes, as increased tone, um, muscle tone, um, like um, increased muscle tone, which leads to spasticity, which can even be painful, and pathological reflexes like the uh, Babinski sign, op, um, which, which uh, signifies a um, dorsal flexion of the big toe after um, scratching of the um, lateral face of um, uh, the, the foot or dorsal flexion after scratching the shin, which is called Oppenheim sign, or dorsal flexion again um, after um, pressing um, the, um, the calf muscle. And all these signs are pathological reflexes pointing towards a, um, um, a lesion in the, um, within the pyramidal tracts. On the other hand, peripheral paresis, which is paresis related to the second motor neuron, may present with decreased or even lost reflexes, a flaccid weak tonus, and 
muscular atrophy like you can say you can see here this is a very good example of what we call a split hand syndrome it's quite it's a it's a very classical sign of uh, lower motor neuron um, affection in motor in ALS and it's called split hand syndrome because you see the um, the the atrophy of the first dorsal interosseous muscle while um, the other hand muscles and especially the uh, the hip the hypothena are quite preserved still so i already mentioned lots of different motor neuron diseases there's a as a whole spectrum obviously of motor neuron diseases and als is just the most common and the most well classic of them um, and as i said als in general affects the first and the second motor neuron first motor neuron diseases um, may be for example primary lateral sclerosis which after a long period of time 10 20 years may then um, evolve into als via affection of the second motor neuron um, whereas um, hereditary spastic paralysis or paraparesis um, affects only the first motor neuron and as the name implicates this is a genetic um, disease on the other hand the second motor neuron classical um, motor neuron diseases affecting only this uh, the second motor neuron are of course um, spinal muscular atrophy the most uh, common um, neuro um, uh, motor neuron disease in children or spinal bulbar muscular atrophy or the so-called Kennedy syndrome a genetic disease affecting mainly the bulbar muscles um, on the level of the second motor neuron mentioned the regions of onset uh, so one third um, of patients show disease onset in the, um, the, the first or bulbar region about one third in the so-called cervical region which is the upper extremities um, only two or three percent in the so-called thoracic region which is obviously the trunk and um, another 30% roughly in the lower region, in the lumbar region, with, with, which, which is uh, the legs. For this study, we uh, included um, 700 um, ALS patients, and we found that on the clinical level, there seems to be something like a distinctive spreading pattern, which, um, which is characterized by onset of the disease in the distal muscles, like you can see here in the hands or in the calf muscles. And on in uh, distally, the extensors uh, are more affected, more severely affected than the flexors. Whereas when you look at the proximal muscles, so at the limb girdles, um, the flexors are usually more affected than the extensors. And that's where you find this classical picture of an ALS patient who might at the beginning only um, uh, show, uh, present with an isolated foot drop without any um, uh, pain or anything um, related mm. and that's often why these patients and only in the in in the in the in the evolving evolvement of uh, in the disease course you you may um, f see that other muscles are affected in a more general manner and that's also one of the reasons why this disease is still so difficult to detect and to detect early. Let's see whether the video is 
working, but it should. Okay. Um, so here you can see a patient with um, a bowel um, onset of the disease. You can see fasciculations and atrophy of the tongue, as well as this hypomobility of the tongue. And you also see an increased masseta reflex as a sign of, of as a first motor neuron sign in the bulbar region. Here you see fasciculations on the region of the chin, even if the patient doesn't open the, the mouth. So second and first motor neuron signs all in the bulbar region. Um, regarding genetics, um, the, it's still the main um, uh, uh, the main percentage of patients um, represent um, uh, what we call sporadic ALS. Around five to ten percent of all patients uh, are diagnosed with a familial or genetic ALS. And in these patients um, with uh, genetic ALS, the peak onset of the disease is generally younger at around 47 to 52 years of, um, of age. Whereas um, in, the, the, in the general population, um, patient population, disease onset is at around 70, peak of disease onset is at around 70 years for sporadic cases. And as I said, it's a fatal disease, it's an aggressive disease with a lethal outcome after around three to five years only. And a death is typically due to CO2 retention due to weakness of, um, um, uh, of, of trunk muscles, respiratory muscles. LS has first been described by Charcot in 1873, and that's also the reason why in French-speaking countries um, the disease is often called um, Charcot's disease. And he um, described a um, symmetric sclerosis of the lateral tracts in, in the spinal cord of patients, and that's where the name comes from, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. On a macroscopic level, um, you can see that um, the anterior spinal nerve roots seem to be kind of shrunken and also grayish in appearance. On the um, muscular or on the pathological level, um, so here you have a, have a, a no, normal muscle with the motor units being innervated by three different axons of one nerve. And what happens if one axon degenerates? Um, so there's denervation and atrophy, for example, in this motor unit A. And uh, after a um, couple of weeks, um, the um, weeks or months, um, the neighboring axon, neighboring axon may um, overtake partial, partially the functioning of um, the degenerated axon via so-called collateral sprouting. On the nervous neuropathological level, um, the, uh, the disease is characterized by loss of motor neurons, obviously but also astrocytosis, so, which is some kind of inflammation um, in spinal cord, brainstem, and motor cortex. And uh, also motor neurons in the pons and mandola oblongata are uh, frequently involved in the disease process, which leads to bulbar symptoms. Here you can see um, the picture taken out of a very, of an important um, neuropathological um, work that has been done by Johannes Brettschneider and Heiko Braag. Um, 
as you probably know, um, you find um, pathological TDP43 accumulation, so that is a misfolded protein, in over 90% of ALS brains. And Heiko Brack could show that you find these accumulations not only in the motor cortex, but that they spread really via stages over very large cortical, sorry, and even subcortical areas, showing that this is really not only a motor neuron disease, but effect, effectively a, a multi-system degeneration. For the clinical approach, um, differential diagnostic effectively bases on, um, on the um, EMG, so the needle myography that you can perform in the different regions I mentioned. And what you see in a, in a denervated muscle, as I told you, as I, as I mentioned before, um, Due to degeneration, you, you will find what we call um, pathological spontaneous activity. So even if the muscle itself is at rest, due to degeneration, you find um, motor units that are expressing, expressing action, even if they shouldn't. And in the later course of the disease, uh, via collateral sprouting, you will find large and polyphasic, so um, deformed responses um, of the motor, neurons, motor um, units. So this is for the second motor neuron or for the peripheral nervous system. You can also um, examine the function of the central um, motor neuron via transcranial magnetic stimulation. Here you see Anthony Barker, who, who presents the first um, magnetic stimulator in the 1970s, I, th 70s, I think so. And since then they haven't changed a lot because the, the technique is simple, but very effective. You stimulate the motor cortex via, um, via a coil. In this coil, there is a magnetic field. This magnetic field induces an electric field in the motor cortex. And via this electric field, um, motor neurons can be um, activated. Um, and with this, you can, the response the physiological response of this activation of the motor, neuro, motor units, uh, of the motor neurons, I'm sorry, can be um, recorded or at the level of the muscle, like for example, the hands or also the, the legs. And with this, you can quite well um, 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 measure or examine the integrity of the first motor neuron or the corticospinal tract. For, since a couple of years, um, there has been uh, this or discussion about involvement of the uh, corpus callosum in uh, ALS and the uh, uh, new um, or modern uh, MRI techniques like um, diffusion tensor imaging could show effectively that uh, the motor part of the corpus callosum is affected in ALS and um, with, um, with the double pulse transcranial tra magnetic stimulation protocol, you can also um, study um, the uh, cortical cort uh, so, so, uh, the cortical cortical connectivity or the integrity of the neurons um, connecting both uh, motor cortices. Um, so motor cortices, and uh, here we could show that in um, ALS patients, effectively, there is a um, decrease in this functional connectivity of the interneurons um, connecting both um, motor cortices. So here we measured what we call interhemispheric inhibition, which is a good 
marker for the functional integrity of these interneurons. And here you can see this is a curve of uh, normal controls. If you increase the, um, the intensity of the stimulation, the um, inhibition of the, of the interneurons increases as well until it gets like to a kind of a, of a platform, uh, a steady state. And this is um, what, we what we see in ALS patients. So ALS patients seem to exhibit almost no um, intercortical inhibition, showing us that they have a severe dysfunction, um, not only of the descending um, motor neurons, but also of the connection between both hemispheres. Just some words about um, possible biomarkers. Um, there has been um, a nice paper published in, at J in JNNP in 2016, showing that so-called neurofilaments in the CSF can distinguish, can distinguish between um, ALS or MND, here on the left, and MND mimics, and even the, um, the, the level of, of these um, neurofilaments can, um, can pre might predict um, disease progression. Here you can see um, month to death in all the survival curves of different patients, with patients with the highest level of neurofilaments showing the most aggressive disease course. Luckily, uh, we know that we don't have to necessarily uh, check these biomarkers only in the spinal fluid. We can also check them, which is much easier, of course, for the patients in um, the, um, the, the blood. I mentioned before, and this, I think this is very important to, to understand or to know, that um, ALS really is not only a disease of the motor system. Around 5% of patients um, show a real full-blown frontotemporal dementia in combination with their motor neuron disease. But frontal signs, so frontal executive dysfunction signs may be found in over one third of all ALS patients, especially in patients with bulbar signs. And I always show this um, quite beautiful um, picture, I think, from Van Ees, um, uh, from a Lancet publication, where you see really the classical ALS or motor neuron disease with upper and lower motor neuron signs on the one end of the spectrum and the FTD, classical FTD with all its, um, its, uh, its variants on the other um, end of the spectrum. But in the middle, there's, uh, there's, a lots, of, there's lots of different variants um, with, uh, of, of motor neuron diseases mixed with um, frontal deficits. I wanted to um, discuss some Rather, rather rare variants um, of the disease with often a better prognosis, like for example, the so-called flail arm syndrome or flail leg syndrome. And they, these uh, syndromes are um, characterized by, um, by um, uh, paresis and um, atrophy of the, the, the limbs. And I managed. I, I, I mentioned spinal spinal bulbar muscular atrophy type Kennedy, which is a rare genetic disease you only find in in men. And finally, primary lateral sclerosis. I mentioned this before. This is this is a first motor neuron um, disease, which shows a very very long um, disease progression progression over decades. Here you, uh, I show you an example of a patient 
with the so-called flail arm syndrome. So you see this atrophy of, um, of the, 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 the shoulder girdle, but also of the limb muscles um, with mainly um, uh, um, lower motor neuron um, signs, which is atrophy, uh, flaccid tone, and fasciculations. Because this uh, is a very, is a kind kind of a, an untypic presentation of maybe an atypic presentation of ALS, we saw we could show that a lot of uh, flail arm syndrome patients are in fact. Uh, at the beginning, not diagnosed correctly, most of them being diagnosed with a multifocal motor neuropathy. The disease course is, uh, is atypical, um, being a little bit better or less, less aggressive um, than the classical ALS. Here you see the survival curves of flail arm syndrome patients in yellow and classical ALS in gray. I mentioned primary lateral sclerosis several, uh, several times, so we don't have to go into this into very much detail. Um, just uh, to mention that um, antispastic therapy um, may show inconsistent effects. You can try in a P PLS patients to um, to to you can tr have a try with L-dopa, uh, L-dopa. Uh, um, they may may show slight bladder dysfunction, um, and also the dorsal spinal tracts can be affected, which uh, which makes it difficult sometimes to um, to diagnose this uh, disease correctly as a, a, a motor neuron disease. In the second part of my talk, um, I would like to discuss um, 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 treatment options and uh, recent um, studies on treatment in ALS. In, uh, in the um, 19th century, Charcot said, therapeutic options uh, to treat ALS are lying in the future. And he was right, it was only in the 1990s when uh, Rilozole um, was discovered and has then, since then been for a very long time the only um, drug that has been authorized um, because it slows the disease um, progression. It has anti-glutamatergic effects against um, exosotoxicity, and it is also a free radical scavenger, and thus has antioxidative effects. And finally, it can also have some me me mem membrane stabilization uh, in effects, and thus reduce um, cell cellular energy demand. It increases um, the probability to survive the first treatment year by six to 12 percent. Um, there's, there's a wide range because this really depends on, on, on the study. An early treatment um, with Rilozole slows the decay of motor functions and um, the prolongation of life has been shown to be around six to 20 months. And this is also very, there's also a very wide range. Um, so six to 20 months, it's a quite wide range because um, there might be a bias in the first studies that were performed as they, um, they, um, uh, there was a huge pre-selection of very specialized centers where patients were, have been di were diagnosed early and on the other hand were being taken care of or in uh, were being taken care of at the very high level. 
And uh, since um, uh, for for a couple of years, in um, uh, there has been a new kid on the block, which is Eda Ravone or Radikava, which is a, f a free radical scavenger. Um, and it has been approved in Japan since 2011 for the treatment, for the post treatment of uh, acute ischemic stroke, but it has never really been in use in Europe or the US until a phase two study um, showed a reduction of one marker of uh, oxidative stress and an effect uh, on the ALS FRS in ALS patients. And the one first phase three study after that showed a significant, significant effect on ALS FRS in a post hoc analysis with a subgroup of quite well defined um, patients. So this was the um, uh, pivotal um, phase three study. Um, and I, I mentioned that um, the effect was most prominent in in a special a very special or very well defined group of patients these patients um, showed of course a definite or probable als according to the revised um ls coreal criteria they sc showed a score of at least two points or more on each of the um, and on each of the ALS FRS items. So, so just briefly, um, the ALS FRS is a 48 uh, point clinical scale. And you um, 48 point clinical scale, the maximum will be would be 48 points, which um, um, which uh, investigates different um, motor functions like swallowing, walking, eating, uh, dressing, turning in bed, etc. And the minimum score you can have on an item is zero and the maximum score is um, four. Patients also had a normal respiratory function and patients had an early, were still early in the course of their disease. So the, the, the medication really seemed to work best the earlier it can be introduced or can be started. Um, so here's the um, the study design. Mm. First, um, um, so in, uh, randomization was preceded by an observation period in which over 12 weeks the slope of the ALS FRS, so the degradation um, in the ALS FRS was calculated. Then patients were randomized, um, double blind, um, um, placebo controlled uh, over um, uh, another um, six cycles with um, either Elaravone or placebo. And the, the primary um, efficiency endpoint was a change in the ALS FRS um, uh, after 24 weeks. To mention that patients in this in, in, in both groups, sorry, had been either on a stable dose of rilozole before inclusion in the study or on no rilozole at all. Here's the um, dosage, dosage and administration scheme. It's a little bit complicated. So as I said, it's, it's IV. Um, patients receive 60, minutes, uh, 60 milligrams IV um, daily over 14 consecutive days in the first cycle and in the second cycle over twice, uh, two times five days. So for example, 
Monday to Friday, Monday to Friday. And this um, also every four weeks. So this is a month um, with a two weeks drug free period in between. So these are the baseline characteristics. Um, as I said, most patients were effectively taking Rilosol uh, on a steady um, level. And uh, the patients in the placebo and in the Edaravone group were quite well matched regarding age and um, age initial symptoms and also um, the ALS FRS. Here you can see um, the, the results. So yellow is placebo and uh, blue is the Edaravone group. And um, after um, uh, 24 weeks of the double blind study, um, patients in the Edaravone group showed a better ALS FRS a score than patients in the placebo group, which means around 30%, about one third less um, physical function loss um, in the Verum group compared to placebo. placebo. Um, here you can see it's a, just a little bit a different uh, kind of showing, um, uh, presenting the data. This is change of ALS FRS score from baseline to the end of uh, 24 weeks. These are the placebo patients. And uh, as it is a progressive disease, um, no patient would really um, show a better um, score over these 24 weeks. And most patients show a decrease in the score of four, five, six, or three points after 24 weeks. And here you can see the, um, uh, the Edarabone group in blue. And you can clearly see that there is some kind of shift um, towards a slower disease progression in the in the uh, Edaravone group. Um, and uh, if you uh, a little bit, if you split the ALS FRS and um, only look at bulbar symptoms, um, fine motor function and gross motor function, you can see that um, Edaravone uh, performed well in all of these um, subdomains. So uh, black is um, uh, Edaravone and uh, gray is placebo. This is uh, the uh, decrease in ALS FRS, in the ALS FRS score. Regarding safety, um, it looks like um, Idaravone is actually quite safe. Um, all more, uh, most patients uh, reported adverse events, but um, adverse events were, were evenly distributed in the Idaravone group and in the placebo group. It seems like um, the most common side effects are actually related to um, either the natural, natural disease progression or to the fact that uh, this is an intravenous application, which might cause at some point inflammation of, um, of the peripheral um, um, vascular system. Um, with even um, spreading um, um, inflammation and fever. And in the post-marketing, yeah, okay, this is this. And the, 
Um, now I would like to mention also the um, the open label extension study. Um, so as it is an open label study, all um, all patients were uh, switched after these um, uh, uh, patients receiving placebo were switched to Edaravone patients that had already been under Edaravone. Um, received continued receiving Edaravone uh, over another 24 weeks. And um, so green, um, sorry, so these are the patients that had been, had not been switched. And these are the um, patients that had been switched from placebo to um, Edaravone. And um, 29, around 30 percent um, it, we, we found a 30% uh, between group difference that was maintained at the end of cycle 12, um, favoring actually patients that were initially already assigned to Edaravone and also speaking in favor of an early, um, an early um, treatment uh, start. And best reactions again um, coming also from the open label study. Um, as I said, lots of um, lots of um, adverse events uh, related to normal disease progression. Um, there's also always this um, uh, the, the the study mentions contusion without really explaining in my view what this means i think it means false and then contusion after false but i never really understood what this actually means so but there's gate disturbance and false um, or contusion a little bit uh, more common in the edaravone group um, than in the placebo group uh, but um, in general adverse events uh, were more or less evenly distributed in both groups, even a little bit more frequent in the placebo group. In um, maybe important to mention that uh, in the post-marketing phase, uh, some allergic re reactions have been reported, mainly which have never, never been um, life-threatening, mainly after during the second or the third cycle not during the first one. To finish, I would also like to again mention that it's not only medical treatment or pharma, pharma, pharmacological treatment that helps ALS patients um, and that increases their survival. We know that, for example, um, non-invasive ventilation can be very helpful to increase survival as we know that patients that show a vital capacity of under 60 percent show a very uh, show a significantly um, uh, decreased survival time here you can see the survival uh, curves this is um, um, vital capacity above 60 percent and these are the patients with um, uh, with a vital capacity of 60 percent or lower it is a little it's the same for the body mass index patients with a low body mass index uh, here in um, red or in black show a, show a decreased survival probability compared to patients with a body mass index of higher than 25 kilograms per square meter. So it is important to, to educate the patients early in the disease um, to, to, to maintain their weight and if it's necessary to even implant a, a percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy sonde to, um, to, um, to maintain the body weight. So to, um, to, sub, to sum up, there are 
two medical treatment options that are authorized uh, at the moment in the US and in Switzerland, but not in Europe, um, which is Rilosol and Edaravone, Rilosol um, orally and Edaravone IV. And a support mutative treatment is very important, such as invasive or non-invasive ventilation, if necessary, a percutaneous antral tube feeding, treatment of sialuria, treatment of pain, etc., physiotherapy, logotherapy on a regular basis, and a high-calorie, high-fat diet. And with this, I finish my talk, and um, I thank you again for your attention, and uh, I now, I'm now open for to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Hubers, for this excellent presentation. Uh, there are four or five questions in the Q&A box. Uh, so we have something like 10 minutes to cover these questions and other questions. So the first question is, how is the CPK levels in ALS? Mm -hmm. It is, uh, it can be um, mildly elevated. So that means at around between 200 and 400 in this range. It can also be normal. Okay, great, thank you. The other question, patient of ALS is very rapid calorie burning and mostly they are malnourished. Would you please throw a light on this mechanism? Yeah, it's a very interesting question. It, at the beginning, we, we, we long time we thought that um, that the um, the weight loss is mainly due to muscle loss, but recently um, there have been studies on uh, on the hypothalamus in the mouse model of ALS pointing towards a more generalized metabolic disturbance or disequilibrium in ALS patients. And of course, the fact that they might have at some point of time swallowing difficulties is one important factor um, that um, may, lead to, may lead to calorie caloric de deficiency. We also know that a high fat diet rather than for example, a high protein diet is, um, can be, is uh, protective in the disease course. We don't, don't know exactly why. Okay, great. Uh, we have two more questions. One is, is ALS complete curable or not? Well, no. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> no, I mean, there <laughs> are... They are promising, um, they are very promising um, uh, studies for genetic ALS. I didn't go into that, um, but there's, a, um, there's one medication, an antisense oligonucleotide for patients with, um, with an SOD1 mutation. So the second most common mutation in familial ALS. This might be a promising start to cure ALS, but the, let's say the normal ALS, the, the, non, the sporadic ALS is not curable at the moment. Um, in contrast to, for example, spinal muscular atrophy, so uh, the, uh, a very co uh, common um, motor neuron disease in children, where we, where we have now um, genetic uh, treatment options. Thank you. I uh, just attended a lecture on ALS in the European Academy of Neurology, you know, just one hour ago. And uh, they were telling that diagnosis is delayed in most of the European countries. 45% of cases are delayed about nine to 11 months. Yeah. Even by the neurologist. Yes, that's true. Any, yeah. How is it in your institution? Is it like this? The cases coming to you are delayed usually? So, um, I mean, of course, we are a, a specialized muscle center. So our, um, uh, in our institution, 
the um, the the delay is less, but still it is around. I would say um, until I see the patient to post the diag diagnosis, I would say it's still three to six months, which is okay. Um, there have been um, there have been um, new diagnostic criteria being proposed in I think 2019. Um, mainly by the Ulm group that really focus on um, this idea of um, um, trying to, to decrease the diagnostic delay by, for example, including genetics or frontal um, deficiency into the diagnostic criteria. Okay, thank you. You mentioned about the neurofilaments uh, in multiple sclerosis, we use the neurofilaments as prognostic factor because in progressive MS, the serum and CSF filaments can be elevated. Yes. Uh, there's one question here about, can ALS be inherited? You just mentioned I think something this, about I think genetics. This, yeah. I, I think we skipped one question. Um, I'll go to it later. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Sorry. Okay. Can ha yes, as I said, so it's like it's five to ten percent where we know the genetic background. Might be more, but we don't screen. If maybe we miss uh, some patients, but in the general population, it's five to ten percent. I really um, suggest to screen, especially young patients, even if the the familial. Um, uh, the the there's no family history. It can be really useful to screen, especially young patients, so which is under the onset age, um, 50 years or younger, and also patients with a with a very aggressive um, disease progression. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, these two drugs you mentioned, we are using them in our hospital. We are using Radicava. We have two patients using it for two years. And Rylozole, more than 15 years. Uh, we have many patients that are still alive, but they are on ventilator, palliative care, trachistomy, big, and they are ventilatory support. And we know the story of uh, Stephen Hawkins. I think he survived 60 years after his diagnosis with the advanced technology support and these things. Uh, it seems you are interested in some of questions here. I can read for you. So which one you want, Professor Hoopers? The respiratory? Um. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, degeneration of respiratory innervation occurs in this condition. Is ventilatory treatment and does it have good prognosis with non-invasive vent ventilation? I can't understand exactly. So if patient improve with ventilation, is it a good prognostic sign? You see so, the question um, So of course, I mean, patients are regularly screened for um, respiratory failure or um, respiratory function loss, even if they don't show any clinical signs or don't remark any clinical signs. And uh, if you introduce uh, non-invasive ventilation, you um, can first um, uh, um, um, uh, increase the quality of life of patients because they might sleep better, for example, are less tired during the day. And you also can um, uh, um, uh, prolong um, the disease course. It's the same for non-invasive, for invasive ventilation, obviously, but in, this is a cultural, also, I think a cultural discussion. I have the impression that in Western, in Northern Europe, patients rather tend to not go for invasive ventilation. Whereas in the UK, for example, patients are often uh, invasively ventilated. I, I wonder what it's like in, in, in your country. I'm interested. So I, do you have lots of patients that are invasively ventilated? Yeah, yeah. Most of the patients, they yeah. reach a stage, they require ventilation. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember one of my patients, she remained on ventilation for 16 years. Mm -hmm. uh, she died from sepsis. Currently now we have one patient on ventilation. Uh, 
intubated, trachostomy, and uh, big. He's now 12 years. He's young, sir. And uh, he is fully conscious, oriented, but yeah. So we go for ventilation. We don't, uh, I know in some countries, the patient has the right to say, I don't want to be ventilated. Sure. Right. But uh, here we don't have this issue. A patient comes with respiratory failure, has to be ventilated. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. And we don't disconnect ventilator, ventilator yeah. support. I don't know what's in your country. The patient has the right not to be ventilated. Of course. So we discussed this quite early in the disease course. And most of the patients, they uh, they make kind of a testam testament uh, saying they don't want to be invasively ventilated. It's very common. It's very uncommon on the uh, that they are actually invasively ventilated. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. And, and if you ventilate them, you'll go to the court. Yeah. If, if we don't do, we will go to the court. I <laughs> yeah, uh, there's interesting. No question. Yeah, yeah, there are different different protocols, different yeah. cultures. And, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's one question. What triggers ALS disease and how long can patient live with ALS? Yeah, I mean, as I said, there's a wide range of... Uh, Motorimmune diseases okay. and also ALS is a very, very has a it's a wide range of um, uh, can have a show a wide range of clinical pictures actually. I mean there are these studies showing that in gen or in the, the median survival time is three to five years, but it can vary really, and we don't know what triggers ALS. We don't know whether there's a trigger. There is some positive correlation with smoking, but it has never been really proven. Um, and there are some, uh, there are some reports on, um, uh, on, on a correlation with uh, certain, but very special bi bacteria, like for example, you find them in Guam. So this has been, but this is a very, um, th Apparently, these there are some reports on patients in Guam or in F Florida, where they have uh, like um, lakes uh, with a special kind of uh, cyanobacterium. But this is really it's very speculative. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know the American <laughs> Academy meeting which was yeah. in April. Uh, they presented uh, data about toxic environmental elements plus the genetic uh, uh, mutation of ALS. And interestingly, they reach uh, in certain states, it's highly endemic with ALS due to exposure of certain uh, lead, as you mentioned, heavy metals, environmental, culture, uh, agricultural pesticide. So they uh, categorize some countries at low risk of ALS and high risk of ALS. So the high risk were uh, fully contaminated areas. What you mentioned, lead pollution in the environment. So there is some toxic element, uh, heavy metals, environmental factors identified uh, through epidemiologic, epidemiological studies. Yeah, but the, I mean, I would be interested in this study because if the, high, the, the, the heavy metals have been around for, for decades. And I recently read a study where they showed that there's no link really. So it's it's always a, it's difficult to say. Uh, yeah, yeah, the causal is not clear, but I have this on my desktop. I can email it to you if you like. That would be great. I would really yeah, appreciate yeah, actually, that. Yeah, yeah sure, Thank I'll you. do. It's actually detailed study about, which was surprising to me because you know about the Gawam uh, yeah. high incidence and high uh, yeah, prevalence yeah. and so on. Uh, there's one question here from uh, Dr. Mona. Can this drug be used for PLS or bulbar onset? I, I think she means radicava. Can radicava be used for it's PLS bulbar. or bulbar onset? It, well, so for bulbar onset, it's a great. It's great because these are aggressive patients, uh, and. Um, yeah, you can really slow down the disease progression because it's so steep. The slope is so steep. Um, for PLS, I wouldn't suggest it because PLS really is like, as I said, can can take 20, 20 years slowly progression. 
I think there's no use of radi radicava in uh, in PLS. Advanced case. Oh, PLS. There's one question here. Uh, there once a viral challenge, that so-called ice bucket challenge, in order to raise awareness about ALS. In the panelist opinion, how far the relevance of this challenge to spread awareness among community? I don't know. I mean, in the community, of course, <laughs> the disease was known, but I I have the impression that it it spread awareness in the general population. That's that's true. Um, yeah. Yeah. Actually, we the neurologist we don't like to make this diagnosis because uh, you you mentioned this is a fatal disease. Though some of our, our patients survived on ventilation for 10, 15 years, but we had to make this to make this diagnosis. I wonder if we will scare the community by symptoms of ALS. Then anyone who's choking or having cough will will start thinking this is his disease. I don't know for rare disease. Better not to make awareness among society. Maybe among neurologists would be okay. The medical community can be aware. True, I think so too. The um, yeah, be because we see more and more patients. I guess you as well as me, who show some fasciculations, benign fasciculations, and then they worry that it might be ALS, and it's very difficult to to calm them down at some point of time. Yeah, yeah. I saw in uh, my life something like twenty-five patients with ALS. It's a rare disease. Uh, maybe a few are alive, majority died at different ages. The youngest one was 28 years old, mm. who was exposed to jellyfish uh, bite in the sea. In the sea. Mm. And repeatedly, so this uh, confirmed the toxic theory, actually, one of the theories of ALS. Mm. And it was confirmed in UK, and he came, died with respiratory failure. Uh, one question here from Karim, what is the role of steroid in ALS? Oh, there's no role of steroids in ALS. Okay, very short answer. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, any uh, studies on stem cell therapy? There are studies on stem cell therapy. They are still a little bit in the um, in uh, they are in the in the still in in baby in baby steps. Let's put it. Let's say baby in baby shoes. Stem cells might be a promising target for ALS. The problem is that they have, there has been a lot of, um, um, how do you say, a lot of misconduct with uh, stem cell th therapies, meaning that patients uh, went to, uh, e for example, Eastern Europe countries and paid thousands and thousands of euros, um, 20 thousands of euros, for some kind of um, obvious, um, not unclear stem cell therapy. So it is. it might be a good option, but it has to be really regarded with caution. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe the question before the last, is ALS related to age? Is it age related? Yes, age, age or AIDS, uh, to age. AIDS. No, no, not AIDS, <laughs> AIDS. Um, Yes. How many years old? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the it is um it's a neurodegenerative disease of the aging nervous system. So as I said, classical ASS onset is uh, around seventy. So it's an okay. of the it's a disease of the older population. Yeah, I think ALS is spectrum disease, isn't it? Sorry. ALS is a spectrum disease. Yes. I mean, we have many variants. You mentioned the yeah. upper limb flail and PLS, and uh, we are about to finish. Uh, we have one question only. Uh, you mentioned you screen the family of patients with uh, ALS. You mentioned that there's genetic uh, predisposition. So if you have a patient with, and we identify the gene, do you screen the family for better diagnosis? This is a, a difficult question. It's a difficult question to answer. So, um, okay. Well, let, let, I, can, I can I can answer it, but it's difficult. Yeah, try. So we we um, we might suggest it 
to the children if we find the gene. But first of all, of course, the children need to be um, um, uh, um, need to be major, so they can't be under eighteen. Um, okay. And uh, this is the this is so the, you need to I mean you need to ex to explain to the uh, to the children the use and non-use of. Um, of genetic, uh, of genetic testing you can't just screen them uh, it's 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 really up to them to decide whether they want to be screened or not okay thank you uh last question i promise can als be prevented based on the environmental factors if you move from high risk area to low risk area Probably not. I mean, it's not like it's not it's not like MS where we have this uh, obvious um, where we think there might be some kind of early um, early modulation of the immune system, and then uh, there are high and low uh, regions, high regions with high vitamin D or low vitamin D. The only thing we can maybe suggest to patients is stop smoking. But this is always a good uh, good option <laughs> for any kind of disease. On the other on the other hand, no, you apparently you can't really you can't. Okay, this is the last question. Really, are there any early diagnostic method of ALS that we could predict in early pregnancy? ALS and pregnancy. I, uh, so you mean at the for the are there any early diagnosis? Are there any early diagnosis method of ALS? That oh, I see. <laughs> so you, you want to... Maybe the fetus? If, if, the, if the fetus is... Fetus. Has, might, oh. might, well, um, well, the answer is probably no. Yeah, yeah. No, the answer is no. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, he said fetus. So with this, we can close the session by thanking you for this interesting and interactive and excellent presentation, Professor Hoopers, and uh, hope to see you again in face-to-face uh, -face or in virtual lectures. I would like to thank the organizers, Biologix, Emirate Neurology Society, and MCO, and thank the audience, the participants, for their very fruitful questions. Thank you very much, Professor Huber. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks to the audience. Thanks for inviting me. It was a very uh, interesting discussion for me as well. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. Good night. Bye bye. Bye.